I was in Iraq, rolling down the road in an armored vehicle, and then boom, an explosion goes off. And if you ever seen those fireworks on 4th of July, like a fountain, it was like that. And it was at night, so you could clearly see the explosion. As Soon as the explosion goes off, you hear on the radio, you're hearing chatter. Push through, push through, push through, stop, 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 conflicting messages. Now, why were they saying push through? Once you're attacked, the enemy knows your location. You have a fixed location. So then typically the enemy would go ahead and mass their fire towards that location. So they would shoot mortars or they would shoot machine gun fire. So you want to get out of what they call the kill zone. Now, as my vehicle is moving forward, the smoke dissipates and I clearly see a vehicle laying on its side and I see five bodies on the ground. So I get on the radio and I say, hey, bodies on the ground, I'm dismounting. I tell my driver to stop take the headset off, get out of the vehicle, start going towards the first body. Now I'm hearing a lot of screaming, a lot of moaning, people in pain. And I would later find out that these soldiers, they had slipped back discs and they had lacerations. Didn't know that at the time. So the first one I come up across, I look down and I see the leaf, right? This was the Colonel, this was the Lieutenant Colonel. And there he is laying on the road. So I look down and he shoots his arm up towards me. And he says, help me up. So I grab his arm, I help him to his feet. He's walking around, he's staggering a little bit. He just had what I think is a concussion. And he's trying to go towards the other soldiers that are on the ground screaming. He's like, I gotta help the soldiers. I have him by the elbow. He's kind of trying to fight me off, right? He's trying to go towards those soldiers. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, sir. We need to get you medical attention. I'm trying to get him in the back of my vehicle where there's a medic. So I'm finally able to do that, and then I go and help the other soldiers. I help put them on the litters, put them inside of armored vehicles so that we can go ahead and move towards a medical treatment center. Now, once I get back to the vehicle, I have everything ready to go. The soldier that I have in my vehicle, he's screaming. He's in a lot of pain, so the colonel looks at me and says, give him the morphine, right? Because you're supposed to travel with morphine. So I, I look at the medic, I say, hey, give him the morphine. And the medic looks at me and says, I left the morphine back on base. I don't have the morphine. Can you imagine the frustration and the anger in that moment, not being able to relieve the immediate suffering and pain that was happening? So we go ahead and continue to move up north. The command sergeant major at that time, he radios into me, he says, hey, is anyone listening to this net? And of course we had the guys in the back, everyone had the headset on. And I said, yeah, everyone's, everyone's listening. He says, tell everyone to take their headsets off. And I was like, hey guys, take your headsets off. And the Colonel looks at me and says, does that mean me too? And I said, I, I, I'm not sure, sir. You do, you, know, you do what you want, but I'm telling you what the Command Sergeant Major says. So he takes his headset off. And the Command Sergeant Major at that moment says, listen, if you get hit again, if there's another attack, then you need to push through at all costs. It does not matter if you lose a vehicle, you keep going forward with the Colonel. So I said, okay. And we continue forward. Now, the attack that day was an improvised explosive device, which is commonly referred to as an IED. It was actually a step further than that. It was the EFP. It was an explosive force projectile. And it didn't mature completely, but it had enough impact to knock that vehicle on its side. I had to leave three or four vehicles there to provide security while we were waiting for infantry to come and take over the security and the recovery of that vehicle. And everyone ended up okay for the most part. Now there were three main lessons that I took away from this mission. The first one being that the real leaders emerge in chaos. And what do I mean by that? So we were involved in an attack. It was a little confusing. It was a little ambiguous, but the individuals that have the rank on their chest that says they should be in charge, that they are responsible. A lot of them were quiet during this mission. A lot of them were not trying to provide guidance. A lot of them were not out there trying to pick up the bodies and fasten them to the litters and making sure that we had security on site, okay? Now, I was not overall in charge of this mission. I just happened to be at that place at that time. So it was very peculiar to me how you have loud and brash leaders that exist during times of peace. But when chaos unfolds, you don't hear from them, right? So you will find your true leaders when everything is going wrong. I think this applies outside of the military as well. Next is life can be random. 
So we go through training in the military and they always teach us to look for indicators. You can detect if there's an explosive here because there's an indicator. You have dozens of indicators. You might even have a hundred indicators. But what they don't tell you is that there could be no indicators at all. And there could still be a bomb there. There could still be an explosion. So at a certain point, it's left up to chance. You can't detect every explosive. Some of them will just hit you randomly. And it took me a while to comprehend that. Life can be arbitrary. Life can be random. Bad things happen to good people. So that was something that really began to sit with me more after this experience. Next thing is that sometimes action, any action is better than inaction. When a situation like that unfolds, the first instinct to a lot of people is to freeze. They freeze and they wanna know, is my safety okay? Am I okay? Are my people okay? But you have to take action. When horrible things occur, when chaotic and stressful things occur, you have to look at the action. And it doesn't have to be the most perfect action. It doesn't have to be the best action, but sometimes you just need to take action and make progress and start to let the situation develop. Now, I remember coming back from this mission and I started to think a little bit more serious about all the implications about going out on missions. You know, a lot of times when you go out, you're not guaranteed you're coming back or the people that you're leading are actually gonna be coming back. And then you start to, to reflect and think, about uh, the purpose of the mission. You know, what am I out here doing? And, you know, you really have, you really start to have some tough conversations with yourself. And as a young man, a lot of times you think that you're invincible, right? <laughs> and when you go through an experience like combat or war or violent situations, you, 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 uh, you realize that there's a stark realization that you are not invincible, that time is precious, and life is precious. So I hope that wherever you are on your journey in life or with your career or whatever, that this story is able to benefit you in some small way. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.